Hey everyone, and welcome back for another deep dive. Always excited to be back. Today, we're taking a deep dive into the world of true crime, but uh, we're going beyond those attention-grabbing headlines. We're going to unpack these recent cases. They're strange, they're unnerving, each one's seemingly stranger than the last. And we're going to uncover the patterns, the implications, and really try to understand the big questions they raise about crime and justice in our world today. It's a topic that never ceases to fascinate, yeah. right? And to help us unpack all of this, I've got our expert here with us, ready to dive in. Absolutely. Let's get into it. Okay, so we've got viral fame gone wrong, we've got cold cases cracked wide open, and even a story that feels like it's ripped straight from the pages of a thriller. Let's start with someone whose 15 minutes of fame took a dark turn. Joseph Malinowski, probably better known to the internet as LT Dan. You know, the hurricane report guy. Oh, right, right. He's found himself in some serious legal hot water in Tampa. The details are still under wraps, but it really makes you think, how well do we really know the personalities we embrace online? It's a question we're grappling with more and more mm. as social media blurs the lines between a persona and, well, reality. You see someone cracking jokes during a hurricane yeah. and you think you know them. You feel they're your friend. Exactly. Like they're a buddy. Mm. But what we're seeing is often just a carefully curated image mm. and the internet, well, it has a way of amplifying that, creating these, mm. these parasocial relationships where the lines of what's real get very, very blurry. And that line between the online persona and the real life consequences, that seems to be at the heart of Malinowski's case. It's a stark reminder that behind every meme, behind every viral video, there's a real person with their own complexities and potentially their own demons. Speaking of blurred realities and unsettling situations, we have the truly disturbing case of Torlina Fields in Kentucky. This aspiring actress is now at the center of a horrific crime involving her own mother. The details are incredibly difficult to hear, and while we don't know the full story yet, it does make you think about the potential for hidden struggles and the weight of keeping up appearances, especially for those chasing their dreams in the unforgiving world of show business. It's that contrast in Fields' case that I find particularly unsettling. You have this aspiring actress, someone who, by nature of their chosen profession, seeks the spotlight, seeks public adoration. And then you have this gruesome act committed within the supposedly safe haven of her own home. Right. It's a grim reminder that darkness can fester behind closed doors and that the potential for violence exists even within the closest of relationships. The ones we assume are the safest. It's a stark reminder that things aren't always as they appear, and that's for sure. And tragically, Field's case isn't the only one in our collection that forces us to confront the horrors of domestic disputes. In Las Vegas, an argument, and this is over something as, I don't know, seemingly trivial as a Trump yard sign, escalated into violence, leaving one man shot and another run over with a car. Wow. It's a stark illustration of how quickly disagreements, especially in today's climate, can turn dangerous. And political polarization has just seeped into every corner of our lives, hasn't it? It often fuels this outrage, this this animosity that's already there. Mm. This case, I think, really underscores the urgent need for open and respectful dialogue, even when, especially when disagreements arise. When political beliefs become so deeply entrenched that they lead to violence, well, it tears at the very fabric of our society, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. It's a sobering reminder that words have power. And in some cases, those words can incite actions with absolutely devastating consequences. Without a doubt. Speaking of cases with far-reaching consequences, let's shift gears to one that's been making headlines for years now, the Delphi murders. For those unfamiliar, this case involves the tragic deaths of two teenage girls, Libby German and Abby Williams, back in 2017. Richard Allen, a local man, he confessed to the murders but later recanted that confession, claiming he confessed during a mental health crisis. Now, his defense team is pointing the finger at a white nationalist pagan cult called Odinists, claiming that the crime scene had pagan symbols, although law enforcement hasn't confirmed that. It's a truly bizarre twist in an already complex and tragic case. This case is a fascinating example of how quickly a narrative can shift, especially when you introduce elements like fringe groups and alternative explanations. The defense's strategy is a risky one. By bringing up the Odinists, they're essentially presenting a new suspect, even if that suspect is an entire group. It's a way of introducing doubt. It's classic, really, but it'll be fascinating to see how this plays out in court. It sounds like something straight out of a true crime drama, doesn't it? 
It really does. And speaking of high-profile cases that seem ripped from the headlines, we have former President Donald Trump back in the news. He's currently criticizing the judge overseeing his January 6th Capitol riot case, even calling the judge evil after some evidence was made public, it's just another layer of complexity in his ongoing legal battles. Trump's legal cases have always been lightning rods for debate, haven't they? And this one is no different. They touch on so many crucial aspects of our justice system. Accountability, freedom of speech, the influence of public opinion. In this case, it transcends legal technicalities. It's a conversation about the very soul of our democracy. Absolutely. And while these cases captivate the public's attention, there are others that raise serious concerns about the very foundation of our justice system. Take the case of Robert Robertson in Texas, for example. His execution was halted just in the nick of time due to concerns about the forensic evidence that was used to convict him. Oh, wow. It turns out a misunderstanding of medical findings might have led to his wrongful conviction. This case is chilling because it forces us to confront a terrifying reality, the fallibility of forensic science. We tend to think of things like DNA evidence and fingerprints as irrefutable proof. But the truth is, these are tools that are interpreted by humans. And humans make mistakes. That's right. Robertson's case is a stark reminder that our justice system, while striving for fairness, it's not infallible. And sometimes the consequences of those mistakes, they can be absolutely dire. It makes you wonder how many other cases are out there where flawed evidence might have led to a miscarriage of justice. And speaking of past convictions, the Menendez brothers, who were convicted of killing their parents back in 1989, they're back in the spotlight. Oh, really? Their uncle recently spoke out, insisting that they should remain behind bars despite their claims of parental abuse. It seems some cases continue to captivate the public imagination, even after decades. The Menendez case was a media sensation, largely because it tapped into these universal anxieties about family dynamics, wealth, privilege, and the dark underbelly of the American dream. And even after all these years, that fascination endures, proving that some stories continue to resonate with us because they force us to confront uncomfortable truths about ourselves and the society we live in. It's a reminder that justice isn't always black and white, and some cases leave us with more questions than answers. Sadly, we have another tragic case involving family, and this one hits closer to home in Wisconsin. A hunter stumbled upon the skeletal remains of Elijah View. The investigation led to the arrest of his own mother and her partner, who are now facing child abuse charges. It's a heartbreaking reminder that sometimes the greatest danger to a child can come from within their own home. This case highlights a tragic reality, the often invisible victims of abuse, and the desperate need for early intervention and support systems to protect vulnerable children. It's a stark reminder that we as a society, we have a responsibility to look out for one another, especially those who are most vulnerable, the ones who can't always advocate for themselves. It's a heavy truth to confront, and it underscores the importance of vigilance and community involvement in safeguarding the well-being of all children. And in a case that sparked outrage and calls for justice, a 34-year-old deaf man with cerebral palsy was subjected to a violent arrest by police in Phoenix. Despite being punched and tased, all charges against him were dropped, and the officers involved are now under investigation for excessive force. This case is deeply troubling, to say the least. It raises critical questions about police conduct, especially towards individuals with disabilities who may not be able to communicate effectively in those high-stress situations. This incident highlights the urgent need for greater awareness, sensitivity, and de-escalation training within law enforcement to prevent such injustices from happening. It's a stark reminder that we still have a long way to go in the fight for equal justice for all, regardless of ability or disability. Absolutely. But amidst these grim stories, we also have an example of justice served, even after decades of waiting. A 60-year-old woman has been charged with murder in a 30-year-old cold case. Back in 1994, a newborn baby's body was found abandoned. Thanks to advancements in DNA technology, they were finally able to track down the mother and bring some closure to this tragic event. This case showcases the incredible power of DNA technology, not just in solving crimes, but also in providing answers and a sense of accountability even after such a long time. It's a testament to the perseverance of law enforcement and the amazing advancements in forensic science. It's like something out of a crime drama, except it's real life. Right. And speaking of real life drama with global implications, get this. A former Indian spy was arrested right here in the U.S. for an alleged assassination plot. Apparently, he was targeting a U.S. citizen involved in activism related to the 1984 anti-Sikh riots. Talk about a case with international intrigue. This case 
shines a light on the long shadows of historical conflicts and the enduring impact of geopolitical tensions. It's a reminder that the past is never truly past, and events that unfolded decades ago can still have repercussions today, even on the other side of the world. It's a tangled web we weave when international espionage and historical grievances collide on our own soil. From international conspiracies to a story that forces us to confront the devastating consequences of drug addiction, Derek Dearman, convicted of murdering five people, including a pregnant woman, was executed in Alabama. Dearman committed the murders during a meth-fueled rage, and he ultimately accepted his death sentence, even expressing, expressing a sense of relief. It's hard to fathom, isn't it? It is. This case presents such a tragic confluence of factors, mm -hmm. substance abuse, mental health, and extreme violence. It compels us to grapple with this complex, often polarizing debate surrounding the death penalty and all the moral and ethical questions it raises. It's a stark reminder of the destructive power of addiction and the profound ripple effects of violence. And sadly, Dearman's case is a harsh reminder that violence can erupt in the most unexpected places. Damien Laurent McDaniel III, only 22 years old, was arrested in Alabama and charged with capital murder and multiple counts of assault. This wasn't a one-time thing either. This was a string of violent incidents spanning days, with victims ranging from adults to children. Chilling, to say the least. The scope and the seemingly random nature of these alleged crimes, well, it paints a very disturbing picture of unchecked aggression, a complete disregard for human life. It's a stark reminder of the complex factors that contribute to violence. Factors like access to firearms, the need for mental health support, and, of course, the deeply rooted societal inequalities that so often go unaddressed. It's a stark and unsettling look at the undercurrents of rage and violence that can plague a community. And closer to home, a Los Angeles middle school found itself at the center of a terrifying incident. Seventeen students needed medical attention after being exposed to an unknown substance. Thankfully, it seems everyone will be okay, but it raises concerns about school safety and the potential dangers lurking in our communities. This incident is deeply unsettling, and it highlights just how vulnerable our school environments can be. It underscores the need for more proactive measures, things like education about the dangers of unknown substances, increased mental health support for students, and really just heightened security measures overall to keep our schools safe. It's a stark reminder that even in places meant for learning and growth, danger can still lurk. So we've covered a lot of ground here, from the depths of human cruelty to, well, glimmers of hope for justice. It's a lot to process. It is. What are some of the common threads you're seeing emerge from these seemingly disparate cases? Well, what's striking is how many of these cases intersect with these broader societal issues. We see these recurring themes of mental health struggles, the pervasive impact of social media, the ever-present reality of domestic violence, and the ongoing debate about criminal justice reform. These aren't just isolated incidents. They reflect deeper, systemic challenges that we face as a society. Let's unpack some of those, starting with mental health. From Richard Allen's alleged confession during a mental health crisis to the tragic case of Torlena Fields, it's clear that mental health plays a significant role in many of these stories. Absolutely. And it's crucial to approach this topic with sensitivity and with nuance. Recognizing that mental illness is not synonymous with violence. However, it's essential to acknowledge the correlation and the desperate need for greater access to mental health resources. I'm talking both within the criminal justice system and in our communities at large. We need to move beyond the stigma surrounding mental health and create a system that provides support and resources, not just punishment. Right. And then there's social media, which played a role in both LT Dan's rise to fame and the potential for misleading narratives in the Menendez case everywhere, isn't it? It really is. Social media has become this double-edged sword. On one hand, it's a powerful tool for amplifying voices and sharing information. But on the other hand, it can be a breeding ground for misinformation, for sensationalism, and the creation of carefully curated personas that don't reflect reality at all. It's a powerful force that can shape public perception, influence legal proceedings, and completely blur the lines between fact and fiction. It's a constant reminder that we need to engage with social media critically, questioning what we see, considering the motivations behind the content that we consume. Absolutely. Don't believe everything you read, right? Exactly. And we can't forget about the sobering reality of domestic violence, which tragically took center stage in the cases of Elijah View and the Las Vegas Trump sign dispute. These cases are heartbreaking reminders of just how pervasive domestic violence is and the critical need for intervention, support, and resources for victims. 
It's an issue that affects all demographics and it demands our attention, our action. It's a call to action for all of us to be vigilant, to recognize the signs of abuse, and to create a culture where victims feel safe coming forward and seeking help. We need to do better. We do. It's a lot to grapple with and it speaks to the need for a more nuanced conversation about crime and punishment. But before we get too deep into those waters, I want to circle back to a couple of cases that really piqued my curiosity. I'll do it. The Delphi murders, with the defense's claim about a pagan cult, that's, that's like something out of a movie. What do you make of that strategy? It's a bold, and some might say risky, move. By introducing this element, the defense is attempting to sow doubt, introduce alternative explanations, even if those explanations seem far-fetched to some. It's a reminder that in the courtroom, perception is often as important as hard evidence. It'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. And then there's Richard Allen's confession, which he later claimed was made during a mental health crisis. It raises so many questions about the validity of confessions under duress or when someone's mental state is compromised. This case sits at this critical intersection of law, psychology, and ethics. When someone is experiencing a mental health crisis, their capacity to understand their rights, the weight of their statements, well, it can be called into question. It's a complex issue with no easy answers and it underscores the need for greater awareness and training within the justice system to ensure that confessions are truly voluntary and reliable. It's about striking that delicate balance between protecting the rights of the accused and ensuring accountability for their actions. Exactly. And finally, we can't ignore the case of the deaf man in Phoenix who was subjected to excessive force by police. It's a stock reminder of the systemic issues that continue to plague law enforcement and the urgent need for reform. Absolutely. This case shines a light on the very real consequences of implicit bias, the over-policing of marginalized communities, and the need for greater accountability within law enforcement. It's a sobering reminder that we still have a long way to go in the fight for equal justice under the law. It's a call to action for all of us to be vigilant, to speak out against injustice, and to demand better from the systems that are meant to protect us. It's a journey we all have a role in shaping, really. And speaking of journeys, that brings us back to a case we touched upon earlier. The cold case that was cracked after 30 years, all thanks to advancements in DNA technology. It's a powerful reminder of the reach of science, but it also makes you think about, you know, the potential downsides. What are your thoughts on that? It's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Yeah. On one hand, DNA technology has revolutionized forensic science, bringing closure to countless families, providing a sense of justice that, you know, might have seemed impossible before. But on the other hand, it raises significant concerns about privacy and the potential for misuse of genetic information. Right. As technology continues to advance, and it's doing so at an unprecedented rate, it's a conversation we urgently need to be having as a society. Where do we draw the line between solving crimes and safeguarding our privacy in this, this digital age? It's a question, honestly, with no easy answers, but it's one we can't afford to ignore. It's a debate that's only going to get more complex, more nuanced, as the technology continues to evolve. It feels like every answer we uncover just leads to even more questions. But I guess that's what makes these deep dives so fascinating, the realization that the world of crime and justice is anything but simple. Exactly. It's about peeling back the layers, you know, looking beyond the headlines and grappling with the complexities of human behavior, societal structures, the systems we've put in place, how they work, how they don't. And sometimes those systems, like the humans who design them, they fail. We saw that in Robert Robertson's case, where a misunderstanding of forensic evidence almost cost him his life. It makes you wonder, what if that last minute appeal hadn't come through? Right. It's a chilling thought. It is. It's a stark reminder that the justice system, while striving for fairness, for accuracy, it's not infallible. Human error, biases, systemic flaws, these can all contribute to miscarriages of justice. And we must, we must remain vigilant in identifying and addressing these vulnerabilities. Robertson's case is a testament to the importance of due process, the right to a fair trial, and this constant pursuit of truth, even when it's inconvenient, even when it's uncomfortable. It's about holding the system accountable, demanding transparency, and advocating for those who may not have the resources or the platform to advocate for themselves. Yes. It's about ensuring that justice is truly blind, not just in theory, but also in practice. Precisely. It's about recognizing that the pursuit of justice, it's an ongoing process, not a destination. Mm -hmm. There will always be room for improvement, for greater understanding, for a more equitable and just system for everyone. And that pursuit of justice isn't consigned to our borders, is it? 
the case of the former Indian spy, arrested on U.S. soil for an alleged assassination plot, a plot connected to a decades-old conflict. It reminds us that the world is interconnected in ways we may not always realize. It's a stark illustration of how historical grievances, political tensions, international intrigue, they can intersect in the most unexpected ways, even on what we might think of as distant shores. This case really underscores the global reach of both conflict and justice, reminding us that the choices we make, the actions we take, they can have ripple effects that extend far beyond our immediate surroundings. It's a reminder that we're all part of a much larger story, a global tapestry woven together by threads of history, culture, the complexities of human interaction. And sometimes those threads, they get tangled, leading to conflicts that can span generations, continents even. And those conflicts, regardless of their scale or their origin, they often leave a trail of trauma, of loss, and this yearning for justice. We saw that in the case of Derek Dearman, a man consumed by addiction who committed a horrific act of violence, taking the lives of five people, including a pregnant woman. Dearman's case is a tragedy on multiple levels. It's a stark reminder of the devastating grip of addiction the devastating consequences of untreated mental health issues, and the ripple effects of violence, how they can shatter families and communities. It's a case that forces us to confront some, some uncomfortable truths about the human capacity for both darkness and despair. And amidst that darkness, it's essential to remember the importance of compassion, even when it's difficult to find. Dearman's case also highlights this complex, often polarizing debate surrounding the death penalty. It's a debate with no easy answers one that forces us to confront our values, our beliefs about justice, and the very meaning of rehabilitation and redemption. It's a debate that's been raging for centuries, and it's one that will likely continue long after this, this podcast episode ends. And rightfully so. It's a conversation that demands our attention, our critical thinking, our willingness to engage with perspectives that may differ from our own. Because ultimately, it's about something bigger than just punishment or retribution. It's about who we are as a society, how we define justice, and the values we want to uphold, even in the face of tragedy and despair. And speaking of tragedy, the case of Damien Laurent McDaniel III, a young man charged with a string of violent crimes, including capital murder, it reminds us that darkness can lurk even in the hearts of those who are just beginning their lives. The scope and the seemingly random nature of McDaniel's alleged crimes, they're deeply disturbing. They paint a picture of unchecked aggression, this, this disregard for human life. This case forces us to confront the uncomfortable reality that violence, it can manifest in individuals from all walks of life, regardless of age, background, or socioeconomic status. It's a reminder that the roots of violence run deep, often stemming from a complex interplay of factors like mental health, access to firearms, systemic inequalities, and the breakdown of social support systems. It's a multifaceted issue, really, with no easy solutions, but it's one that demands our attention, our resources, and our unwavering commitment to creating a safer, more just world for everyone. And while we grapple with these, these larger societal issues, we're also reminded that sometimes danger can strike closer to home, even in places we often perceive as safe havens. The incident at the Los Angeles Middle School, where 17 students were hospitalized after being exposed to an unknown substance, well, it highlights the vulnerability of our learning institutions. This incident, while thankfully not resulting in any fatalities, is a stark reminder that we must remain vigilant in protecting our schools and ensuring the safety of our children. It's a wake-up call to prioritize school safety measures, things like comprehensive drug education programs, mental health support services for students, and enhanced security protocols to prevent unauthorized access and, and potential harm. It's about creating a culture of awareness, responsibility, and proactive prevention to ensure that our schools remain nurturing environments for learning, for growth, for well-being. It's about safeguarding the future, one child, one school, one community at a time. It's a journey we're all on together, and every step we take you know, towards greater understanding, empathy, action, it brings us closer to that goal. And sometimes those steps lead us back to cases that have lingered in our minds, cases that really demand further examination. Absolutely. There are always more layers to uncover, aren't there? Exactly. The Delphi murders, for instance. The defense's claim about a pagan cult being involved, it's, well, it's like something straight out of a true crime novel. It's a bold move, to say the least. Do you think it's a strategy that could actually work? It's a gamble, that's for sure. On the surface, Introducing a, a fringe group like the Odinists, 
into the narrative, it might seem like a distraction tactic, right? Right. But strategically, it's about creating that that seed of reasonable doubt. Hmm. If the jury starts questioning the official narrative, even if they find the Odinist angle far-fetched, it might be enough. They might start to feel some uncertainty. And that's all the defense needs, really. They don't have to prove the theory. Just plant a seed of doubt. Yeah. So it's a high risk, high reward situation for the defense. And then there's Richard Allen, who confessed to those murders, but later claimed he did so during a mental health crisis. It really makes you question the weight of a confession, any confession, when someone's mental state is compromised. That's the heart of the matter, isn't it? The law has to grapple with this delicate balance. Ensuring justice for victims, absolutely but also safeguarding the rights of those who may not be in their right mind to really understand the consequences of their words, their actions. A confession obtained when someone is in such a fragile mental state, well, it raises serious ethical and legal questions. Was it truly voluntary? Was there any coercion involved? Could their mental state have led to a false confession? It's a lot for the courts to unpack. How can we, how can we make sure confessions are reliable while still protecting the vulnerable? It requires a multi-pronged approach, I think. Law enforcement needs better training, more in-depth training on recognizing and responding to individuals in crisis. Having mental health professionals involved in interrogations, when appropriate, that could help ensure that someone's rights are protected. And of course, access to mental health care outside the justice system, that's crucial to preventing these situations from arising in the first place. It's about treating mental health with the same seriousness, the same urgency as we treat physical health. Exactly. And speaking of treatment, or rather the lack thereof, we can't forget the case of the deaf man in Phoenix, subjected to that excessive force by police. It's just, it shines a light on the urgent need for reform in how law enforcement interacts with individuals with disabilities. Absolutely. This case highlights a systemic issue, really. Implicit bias, the over-policing of marginalized communities, these factors all contribute to tragic encounters like this one. We need comprehensive training for law enforcement officers on de-escalation techniques, disability awareness, cultural sensitivity, all of it. It's about bridging the gap in understanding, promoting respectful communication and interactions. It's about building trust and ensuring that everyone, regardless of their differences, feels safe feels respected in their interactions with law enforcement. It's been a thought-provoking conversation, to say the least. So many cases, each one a microcosm of these larger societal issues. Mental health, social media's influence, the pervasiveness of domestic violence, and, and this ongoing struggle for a more just and equitable system for everyone. It's easy to get caught up in the headlines, you know, but when we dig deeper, as we've done today, you start to see the interconnectedness of these issues. They're not isolated incidents. They're symptoms of larger systemic challenges that require our attention, our action. Exactly. And while some cases, maybe even most, leave us with more questions than answers, it's the act of asking those questions, of seeking deeper understanding that moves us forward. A huge thank you to you. I really appreciate you lending your expertise to these complex, these really difficult cases. Your insights have been, as always, invaluable. It's always a pleasure to delve into these discussions with you to try to make sense of it all. And to our listeners, Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this journey, this exploration through the heart of true crime and its impact on our world. Remember, staying informed. Well, that's the first step towards making a difference. So until next time, stay curious, stay engaged, and most importantly, stay safe.